Section three of the most extraordinary trial of William Palmer by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Central Criminal Court, May the fourteenth, eighteen fifty six, part three. Ismail Fisher examined by Mr. E. James. I am a wine merchant at four Victoria Street, City. I am in the habit of attending races and betting. I knew John Parsons Cook. I had known him for about two years before his death. I was at Shrewsbury Races in November 1855. I remember the Shrewsbury Handicap. It was won by the mayor called Polestar, the property of Cook. It took place on Tuesday, November the 13th. I saw Cook upon the course. He looked as well as he had looked at any time since I had known him. I was stopping at the Raven Hotel in Shrewsbury. I know Palmer, the prisoner, very well. I have known him rather more than two years. Cook and Palmer were stopping at the same hotel and occupied a room separated from mine only by a wooden partition. It was a sitting room, and they occupied it jointly. On the Wednesday night, between eleven and twelve o'clock, I went into the sitting room. I found there Cook, Palmer, and Mr. Myatt, a saddler at Rugeley a friend of palmer's they had grog before them i was asked to sit down by cook and i sat down cook asked palmer to have some more brandy and water palmer said i will not have any more till you have drunk yours cook said then i will drink mine he took up his glass and drank the grog off immediately he said within a minute afterwards there is something in it it burns my throat dreadfully palmer then got up took the glass sipped up what was left in it and said there is nothing in it there was not more than a teaspoonful in the glass when he emptied it in the meantime mr reed had come in palmer handed the glass to reed and to me and asked if we thought there was anything in it we both said the glass was so empty that we could not recognize anything i said i thought there was rather a strong scent upon it but i could not say it arose from anything but brandy lord campbell did you put your lips to it witness i did not it was completely drained within ten minutes i retired cook had left the room and then came back and called me from it we went to my own sitting-room he there told me he was very ill and very sick and asked me to take his money mr e james did he state what he was suffering from mr sergeant she objected to this question lord campbell surely his statement of the effect produced on him by what he had just swallowed is admissible witness he said he was very sick and he thought that did palmer had dosed him he handed me over some money between seven hundred pounds and eight hundred pounds in banknotes to take care of he did not sleep in the same room with palmer he was seized with vomiting after he had given me the money and left the room he afterwards came back to my room and again complained of what he had been suffering he asked me to go to his bedroom i went with him mr jones a law stationer went with me he then vomited again violently and was so ill that i sent for a doctor mr gibson who came about half past twelve or a quarter to one i remained with cook till two o'clock i sent for mr gibson a second time and he sent some medicine which cook took after seeing the doctor and taking the medicine he became more composed mr jones and i gave him the medicine next morning about ten o'clock i saw palmer i found him in my sitting-room when i came downstairs he said cook has been stating that i gave him something in his brandy i never play such tricks with people but i can tell you what he was he was deep drunk i should say cook was certainly not drunk lord campbell was he affected by liquor witness not at all approaching drunkenness my lord cook came into my bedroom before i was up the same morning he was much better but still looked ill i gave him back the money about three o'clock on that day thursday i saw cook on the race-course he looked very ill i had always settled cook's bets for him when he did not settle them himself i saw his betting book in his hand it was dark in colour and about half the size of this the witness here produced a small black pocket-book 
on the seventeenth of november saturday by cook's request i paid pratt two hundred pounds his account in the ordinary course would have been settled at tattersall's on monday the nineteenth i advanced the two hundred pounds to pay pratt i knew that cook had won at shrewsbury and i should have been entitled to deduct that two hundred pounds from his winnings if i settled his account at tattersall's i did not settle that account and i have not been paid my advance cross-examined by mr sergeant shee i had known cook about two years and palmer longer they were a good deal connected in racing transactions do you know that they were partners i don't remember settling any transactions in which they were jointly interested and i don't know that they owned horses jointly they appeared very intimate and were much together generally staying at the same hotels i was not at the worcester meeting i don't know whether palmer won at shrewsbury as well as cook the races began on the tuesday about two o'clock polestar ran about an hour afterwards but i cannot tell the exact time i saw cook on the course after the race and he appeared much elated polestar won easily in the evening when i went into the sitting-room there was a candle on the table a glass was ordered for me when i sat down i don't remember drinking anything but i cannot swear that i did not i am a good judge of brandy by the smell i said there was nothing particular in the smell but the glass was so completely drained that there was very little to smell i counted the money cook gave me i had been at the unicorn that evening quite an hour before i dined at the raven about six o'clock i did not see cook after the race on the wednesday till i saw him at the unicorn between nine and ten o'clock in the evening i merely looked into the room i saw sanders the trainer cook palmer and a lady I can't say whether they were drinking. Did it happen that a good many people were ill on that Wednesday at Shrewsbury? I mean people connected with the races. No, I don't know that there were. On the Wednesday it was damp underfoot, but I forget whether it rained. I saw Cook several times on the course. On the Thursday the weather was cold and damp. I don't know that Cook and Palmer breakfasted together on the Thursday morning. On the 17th of November I received a letter from Cook. The letter was read. It was dated Rugely, November the 16th, and in it Cook said, It was of very great importance to Palmer and to himself that £500 should be paid to Pratt on the next day, that £300 should be sent, and he would be greatly obliged if Fisher would pay the other £200 immediately on receipt of the letter, promising to give it him back on the following Monday at Tattersall's he added that he was much better re-examined by the attorney-general i never intended to say that cook and palmer were partners did you notice any change of feeling on the part of cook towards palmer he never had any great respect for palmer but i did notice a change in him it was a handicap race that polestar won palmer had a horse called chicken which ran on the thursday and lost he had betted upon the race cook was not more elated at winning than people usually are i am not sure that i drank any brandy and water while i was staying at the raven thomas jones examined by mr wellsby said i am a law stationer in carey street london i was at shrewsbury races last november and i lodged at the raven i arrived there on a monday night i supped with cook herring fisher and gravett cook appeared well I saw him on the Tuesday and Wednesday, and he then also seemed quite well. Fisher and I went to the Raven between eleven and twelve o'clock on Wednesday night. Reed was there, and he invited Cook into my room. Palmer was also there. After the party broke up, Fisher came and told me something about Cook, in consequence of which I went with him to Cook's bedroom. He complained of something burning at his throat and of vomiting some medicine was brought pills and a draught cook refused to take the pills i then went to the doctor's and got some liquid medicine and gave him a small quantity in a wine glass he was in bed about a quarter of an hour afterwards he took the pills also and i left him between six and seven o'clock next morning i saw him again he said he felt easier and better he looked pale this witness was not cross-examined george reed examined by mr bodkin 
i live in victoria street near farringdon market i keep a house frequented by sporting characters i am acquainted with palmer i saw him at shrewsbury races on tuesday as well as cook he appeared to be in his usual health i saw him also the next day and he was apparently in the same health i stayed at the raven on the wednesday night i went between eleven and twelve into the room in which were palmer and cook there was more than one gentleman in the room i had some brandy and water there i saw that cook was in pain almost immediately after i entered he said to us there is something in the brandy and water palmer handed me the glass after it had been emptied i said what is the use of examining a glass which is empty i believe cook left the room i did not see him again i saw him on the following morning at eleven o'clock he was in the sitting-room he said in my hearing that he was very ill cross-examined on tuesday he was well as usual he never looked a strong man but one having delicate health he was not in the habit of complaining of ill health by the court i had some of the brandy and water and it did not make me ill re-examined by the attorney-general my brandy was taken from another decanter which was sent for when i went in cook appeared to be a delicate man but i never knew anything to be the matter with him he frequented races everywhere i never knew him prevented by illness from going to races william scaife gibson i am assistant to heathcote surgeon of shrewsbury on the fourteenth of november last i was sent for and went to the railway hotel shrewsbury between twelve and one o'clock at night i saw mr cook there he was in his bedroom but not in bed he complained of pain in his stomach and heat in his throat he also said he thought he had been poisoned i felt his pulse and looked at his tongue which was perfectly clean he appeared much distended about the abdomen i recommended an emetic he said that he could make himself sick with warm water i sent the waitress for some she brought about a pint i recommend him use a feather he said he could do it with the handle of a toothbrush he drank all the warm water having used the toothbrush he was sick i examined the vomit it was perfectly clear i then told him i would send him some medicine i sent him two pills and a draught the pills were a compound rhubarb pill and a three grain calomel pill they were ordered to be taken immediately and the draught which was seneca a compound of senna magnesia and aromatic spirit was to be taken twenty minutes afterwards it was what is called a black draught half an hour afterwards i gave to jones for cook an anodyne draught i did not see cook afterwards cross-examined by mr sergeant shee did you form any opinion as to what was the matter with cook i treated it as a case of poisoning did you observe anything in the vomit which led you to believe he had been poisoned nothing at all did he appear to have been drinking he appeared to be a little excited but he was quite sensible what he was doing and saying by excited do you mean to say he was tipsy no but his brain had been stimulated with brandy and water the idea of having taken poison would have some effect upon it in your judgment was what you had prescribed a good thing supposing cook had taken poison according to the symptoms i should say it was would it not have been better to get the poison up at once if possible he threw up the warm water lord campbell did that cleanse the stomach yes cross-examination continued yet you thought calomel necessary yes on account of the distended state of the bowels did you see anything like bile in the basin there was some on the edge of the basin but it must have been thrown up before he took the warm water re-examined by the attorney-general the piece of bile was about the size of a pea the water thrown up was perfectly clean cook's tongue was quite clean is that usual in the case of a bilious attack if the stomach had been wrong any length of time the tongue would have been discoloured elizabeth mills examined by mr james in november last i was chambermaid at the talbot arms rugely i had been so about two years i knew the prisoner palmer who was in the habit of coming to the talbot arms i also knew cook the deceased 
on thursday the fifteenth of november he came to the talbot arms he came between nine and ten o'clock at night the prisoner was with him they came in a fly cook went to bed at half past ten o'clock when cook arrived he said he had been poorly and was poorly then i don't remember seeing palmer after he got out of the fly about twelve o'clock on the following day i took cook some hot water and he went out about one o'clock he then appeared poorly he said he felt no worse but was not well he returned about ten o'clock in the evening in about half an hour he went to bed i asked him if he felt any worse than when he went out in the morning he said he did not he said that he had been dining with palmer he was perfectly sober he asked me for an extra piece of candle to read by i saw no more of him that night on saturday morning about eight o'clock i saw palmer at the talbot arms i do not know whether cook had sent for him palmer ordered from me a cup of coffee for cook i gave it to cook in the bedroom i believe palmer was then in the room i left the coffee in cook's hands but did not see him drink it afterwards i went upstairs and found the coffee in the chamber utensil that might be an hour or it might be a couple of hours after I had taken up the coffee. The utensil was on the table by the side of the bed. I do not remember that I spoke to Palmer, nor he to me, about this. I did not see any toast and water in the bedroom, but a jug not belonging to the inn was, about ten o'clock in the evening, sent down for some fresh toast and water. The waitress, Lavinia Barnes, brought it down, I am sure the jug which was brought down from Cook's room did not belong to the Talbot Arms. I saw Palmer go in and out of Cook's room perhaps four or five times on that Saturday. I heard Palmer tell Cook that he would send him over some broth. I saw some broth in the kitchen which some person had brought there ready-made. After Barnes had taken some broth up, ten minutes or a quarter of an hour after the broth came over, I met Palmer going upstairs towards Cook's room. He asked if Mr. Cook had had his broth. I told him I was not aware that any had come for him. While I was speaking, Lavinia Barnes came out of the commercial room and said she had taken the broth up to Cook when it came, but that he refused to take it, saying it would not stay on his stomach. Palmer said that I must go and fetch the broth. He, Cook, must have it. I fetched the broth and took it into Cook's room. Palmer was there. I cannot say whether it was to him or Cook that I gave the broth, but I left it there. I am sure that this was some of the broth which had been sent in. Some time afterwards, about an hour or two, I went up to Cook's room again, and found that the broth had been vomited. About six o'clock in the evening, some barley water was made for Cook. I took it up to him. I cannot say whether Palmer was with him. I cannot say whether or not that barley water stayed upon Cook's stomach. At eight o'clock in the evening, some arrowroot was made in the kitchen. I took it up to cook. I cannot say whether Palmer was there, nor can I remember whether the arrowroot remained on Cook's stomach. On Saturday, about three o'clock in the afternoon, I saw Mr. Bamford, the surgeon. On Sunday morning, I went to Mr. Cook's room about seven or eight o'clock. Mr. Smith, called Jerry Smith, slept in Mr. Cook's room during Saturday night. He is a friend of the prisoner Palmer. I asked Cook if he was any worse. He said he felt pretty comfortable and had slept well since twelve o'clock. On Sunday, more broth, a large breakfast cupful, was brought over for Cook. That was between twelve and one o'clock. I believe Charles Hawley brought it. I took some of that broth up to Cook's room in the same cup in which it was brought. It was hot. I tasted it. I drank about two tablespoons. In about half an hour or an hour, I was sick. I vomited violently during the whole afternoon till about five o'clock. I was obliged to go to bed. I vomited a great many times. During the morning, I had felt perfectly well, and had not taken anything that could disagree with me. It was before dinner that I took the broth. I went down to work again about a quarter before six o'clock. On the Sunday evening, I saw Mr. Cook. He did not appear to be any worse. He seemed to be in good spirits. The illness seemed to be confined to vomitings after taking food. On Sunday night, I saw Cook last about ten o'clock. On Monday morning, I saw him between seven and eight o'clock. 
when I took up to him a cup of coffee. I did not remain to see him drink it. He did not vomit it. Palmer was coming downstairs, as though from Cook's room, about seven o'clock. To my knowledge, Palmer was not there on Monday. Cook got up about one o'clock, and appeared to be a great deal better. He shaved, washed, and dressed himself. He said he felt better, only exceedingly weak. He dressed as if he was going out. Ashmore, the jockey, and his brother, and Saunders, the trainer, came to see him. As soon as he got up, I gave him some arrowroot, which remained on his stomach. He sat up until about four o'clock, when he returned to bed. Between nine and ten o'clock at night, I saw Palmer. He was sitting down in Cook's room. I saw Cook about half-past ten o'clock and not again until about a quarter before twelve o'clock. On the Monday night, about eight o'clock, a pill-box wrapped in white paper was brought for Mr. Bamford's. It was given to me by Miss Bond, the housekeeper, to take up to Cook's room. I took it up and placed the box on the dressing-table. That was before Palmer came. When I saw Palmer, he was sitting by the fire in Cook's room. I went to bed between ten and eleven o'clock. About eight or ten minutes before twelve o'clock, the waitress, Lavinia Barnes, called me up. While I was dressing, I twice heard screams from Cook's room. My room is above, but not immediately over Cook's. I went down to Cook's room. As soon as I entered the room, I saw him sitting up in bed. He desired me to fetch Palmer directly. I told him Palmer was sent for, and walked to his bedside. I found the pillow upon the floor. There was one mauled candle burning in the room. I picked up the pillow and asked Cook if he would lay his head down. He was sitting up, beating the bedclothes with both his hands and arms, which were stretched out. When I asked him to lay his head down, he said, I can't lie down. I shall be suffocated if I lie down. Oh, fetch Mr. Palmer. The last words he said very loud. I did not observe his legs, but there was a sort of jumping or jerking about his head and neck and his body. Sometimes he would throw back his head upon the pillow, and then raise it up again. He had much difficulty in breathing. The balls of his eyes projected very much. He screamed again three or four times while I was in the room. He was moving and knocking about all the time. Twice he called aloud, Murder! He asked me to rub one hand. I found it stiff. It was the left hand. By the court. It was stretched out. It did not move. The hand was about half shut. All the upper parts seemed to be stiff. Examination resumed. I did not rub it long. As soon as he thought I had rubbed it sufficiently, he thanked me, and I left off. Palmer was there while I was rubbing the hand. While I was rubbing it, the arm and also the body seemed to twitch. Cook was perfectly conscious. When Palmer came in, he recognized him. He was throwing himself about the bed, and said to Palmer, "'Oh, doctor, I shall die.' Palmer replied, "'Oh, my lad, you won't.' Palmer just looked at Cook, and then left the room, asking me to stay by the bedside. In about two or three minutes he returned. He brought with him some pills. He gave Cook a draught in a wine-glass, but I cannot say whether he brought that with him. He first gave the pills, and then the draught. Cook said the pills stuck in his throat, and he could not swallow them. Palmer desired me to give him a teaspoonful of toast and water, and I did so. His body was still jerking and jumping. When I put the spoon to his mouth, he snapped at it, and got it fast between his teeth, and seemed to bite it very hard. In snapping at the spoon, he threw forward his head and neck. He swallowed the toast and water, and with it the pills. Palmer then handed him a draught in a wine glass, which was about three parts full. It was a dark, thick, heavy-looking liquid. Cook drank this. He snapped at the glass as he had done at the spoon. He seemed as though he could not exactly control himself. He swallowed the draught, but vomited it immediately, into the chamber utensil. I supported his forehead. The vomit smelt like opium. Palmer said he hoped either that the pills had stayed on his stomach, or had not returned. He searched for the pills in the vomit with a quill. He said, I can't find the pills, and he then desired me to take the utensil away and pour the contents out carefully to see if I could find the pills. I did so and brought back the utensil, 
and told him I could not see the pills at all. Cook afterwards seemed to be more easy. That was about half an hour or more after I had first gone into the room. During the whole of that time he appeared to be quite conscious. When Cook was lying more quiet he desired Palmer to come and feel how his heart beat, or something of that sort. Palmer went to the bedside and pressed his hand, I cannot say whether to the heart or to the side of the face, but he said it was all right. I left Cook about three o'clock in the morning. He was not asleep, but appeared to be dozing. Palmer was sitting in the easy chair, and I believe he was asleep. I went into the next room and laid down. About six o'clock I saw Cook again. I asked if Palmer had gone, and Cook said he left at a quarter before five o'clock. I asked if he felt any worse, and he said no, he had been no worse since I left him. I said, you were asleep when I left. He replied, no, I heard you go. He asked me if I had ever seen anyone suffer such agony as he did last night. I said, no, I never had. He said he should think I should not like to see anyone like it again. I said, what do you think was the cause of all that agony? He said, the pills which Palmer gave me at half-past ten. I do not think anything more was said. I asked him if he would take anything, and he said no. I do not remember seeing Palmer on that day, Tuesday, until he was sent for. On that morning, Cook seemed quite composed and quiet, but his eyes looked wild. There was no motion about the body. About twelve o'clock at noon, he rang his bell, and desired me to send the boots over to Palmer to ask if he might have a cup of coffee. Boots returned and said he might, and Palmer would be over immediately. I took the coffee up to Cook a little after twelve o'clock. Palmer was then in Cook's room. I gave the coffee to Palmer. He tasted it to see whether it was too strong, and I left the room. Mr. Jones arrived by the three o'clock train from Lutterworth. I saw him in Cook's room. About four o'clock I took Cook another cup of coffee. I cannot say whether Palmer was there. Afterwards I saw Palmer. He opened the bedroom door and gave me the chamber utensil, saying that Cook had vomited the coffee. There was coffee in the utensil. I saw Cook several times before I went to bed. He appeared to be in very good spirits and talked about getting up next morning. He said he would have the barber sent for to shave him. I believe I gave him some arrowroot. I did not see him later than half past ten. Palmer was with him when I last saw him. I gave Palmer some toast and water for Cook at the door. Palmer then said to Cook, Can this good girl do anything more for you tonight? Cook said, No, I shall want nothing more till morning. He spoke in a composed and cheerful manner. I remained in the kitchen all night to see how Cook went on, and did not go to sleep. About ten minutes before twelve o'clock, the bell of Cook's room was rung violently. Jones was sleeping in the second bed in the same room. On hearing the bell, I went up to Cook's room. Cook was sitting up. I think Jones was supporting him, with his arms round his shoulders. Cook said, Oh, Mary, fetch Mr. Palmer directly. I went to Palmer's and rang the surgery bell. As soon as I had rung, I stepped off the steps to look at Palmer's bedroom window, where I expected him to appear, and he was there. He did not lift up the sash, but opened a small casement and spoke to me. I could not see whether he was dressed, but I heard and knew his voice. I asked him to come over to Mr. Cook directly, as he was much the same as he had been the night before. I don't remember what he replied. I went back to the hotel, and in two or three minutes Palmer came. I was then in the bedroom. Jones was there supporting Cook. Palmer said he had never dressed so quickly in his life. The question which elicited this answer was, did Palmer make any remark about his dress? After the answer had been given, Mr. Sergeant Shee objected to the form in which the question had been put. Lord Campbell, it seems to me that the examination is conducted with perfect fairness. No leading question, nor any one which could be considered doubtful, has been put to the witness. Examination continued. I left the room but remained on the landing. After I had been waiting there a short time, about a minute or two, Palmer came out. I said, he is much the same as last night. Palmer said, 
oh he is not so ill by a fiftieth part he then went downstairs as though going to his own house he was absent but a very short time and then returned to cook's room i also went in i believe cook said turn me over on my right side i was then outside but the door was open i do not think i was in the room at the time he died i went in just before but came out again jones was there at the time and had his right arm under cook's head palmer was then feeling cook's pulse and said to jones his pulse is gone jones pressed the side of his face to cook's heart lifted up his hands but did not speak palmer asked me to fetch mr bamford and i went for him cook's death occurred about three quarters of an hour after i had been called up mr bamford came over i did not return to cook's room when mr bamford came downstairs he said he is dead he was dead when i arrived after mr bamford had gone i went up to the landing and sat upon the stairs i had sat there about ten minutes when jones came out of the room and said mr palmer wants you or will you go into the room i went into the room where cook was lying dead palmer was there i said to him it is not possible that mr cook is dead he said oh yes he is dead he asked me who i thought would come and lay him out i mentioned two women whom i thought palmer knew he said those are just the women i said shall i fetch them and he said yes i had seen a betting book in cook's room it was a dark book with gold bands round the edges it was not a very large book rather more long than square and had a clasp at one end i saw cook have this book when he stopped at talbot arms as he went to the liverpool races some months before there was a case at the one side containing a pencil i saw the book in cook's room on monday night i took it off the dressing-table and gave it to him in bed he asked me to give him the book pen and ink and some paper i gave him all that was between seven and eight o'clock he took a postage stamp from a pocket at one end of the book i replaced the book on the frame of the looking-glass on the dressing-table palmer was in the room after that time to my knowledge i never saw the book afterwards i afterwards searched the room for it but could not find it when i went into the room after cook's death the clothes he had worn were lying on a chair i saw palmer searching the pockets of the coat that was about ten minutes after the death when i went into the room palmer had in his hand searching the pockets the coat which i had seen cook wear palmer also searched under the pillar and bolster i saw two or three letters lying upon the chimney-piece i never saw them again but i was not much in the room afterwards i had not seen the letters before cook's death the examination in chief of this witness being concluded the court adjourned at twenty minutes past six o'clock till next morning when it met at ten o'clock End of section 3section four of the most extraordinary trial of william palmer by anonymous this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson second day may the fifteenth among the distinguished persons present were the earl of derby earl grey lord w lennox lord g g lennox lord h lennox etc the learned judges lord chief justice campbell and mr baron alderson accompanied by the recorder the sheriffs the under sheriffs and several members of the court of aldermen took their seats on the bench at ten o'clock the prisoner was then placed at the bar the expression of his countenance was sadder and more subdued than on the preceding day he maintained his usual tranquillity of demeanour seldom changing his position and gazing steadfastly at the witnesses the same counsel were again in attendance the attorney-general mr e james q c mr bodkin mr wellsby and mr huddleston for the crown mr sergeant shee mr grove q c mr gray and mr keneally for the prisoner the jury who had been all night at the london coffee-house were conducted into court by the officer who had them in charge 
Elizabeth Mills, who was under examination the previous evening, was again placed in the witness box. She deposed as follows. I had been engaged at the Talbot Arms for about three years previous to Cook's death. Cook first came to that inn in the month of May 1855, and was off and on for some months. I never heard him complain of any illness during that time, except of an affection in his throat. I heard him complain of a sore throat two or three months before his death. He said it resulted from a cold. He took a gargle for it. I believe he had it from Mr. Thirlby. I did not observe any sores about his mouth. I never heard him complain of a difficulty in swallowing. I have seen him with a loaded tongue occasionally, but I never heard him complain of a sore tongue, nor have I heard of caustic being applied to his tongue. It was a month, if not more, before his death that I heard him say that he had a sore throat. I never knew him to take medicine before his last illness. He had a slight cough through cold, but never to my knowledge a violent one. He had not been ailing just before he went to Shrewsbury. On his return from Shrewsbury he complained of being poorly. I left my situation at Christmas and went to my home in the Potteries. Since then I have been in another situation which I left in February. I have seen Mr. Stevens, Mr. Cook's father-in-law, since I have been in London. I cannot say how many times I have seen him, but it is not more than six or seven times. Sometimes we conversed together in a private room. He only came to see whether I liked the place or whether I liked London. We used to converse together about Mr. Cook's death. I have talked to him about Mr. Cook's death at Rugeley. I cannot remember anything else that we talked about, except the death. He has never given me a farthing of money or promised to get me a place. I saw Mr. Stevens last Tuesday at Dolly's Hotel, where I had been in service. Lavinia Barnes was with us. She was the waitress at the Talbot Arms when Mr. Cook died. Two other persons were present, Mr. Hatton, the chief officer of Rugeley, and Mr. Gardner, an attorney at the same place. Mr. Cook's death may have been mentioned at the meeting. Other things were talked of, which I do not wish to mention. Sergeant She, but you must mention them. Witness, I cannot remember what they were. I don't know whether we talked about the trial. They did not ask me what I could prove. My deposition was not read over to me, and Mr. Stevens did not talk to me about the symptoms that were exhibited by Mr. Cook before his death. I had seen Mr. Hatton a few times before. I saw him at Dolly's. He merely dined there. I cannot remember whether he spoke to me about Cook's death. He might have done so. I cannot remember whether he did or not. I know he asked me how I did. A laugh. I saw Mr. Gardner once at Dolly's, and once in the street, and I swear these were the only occasions I ever saw him. I never went with him to a solicitor's office. At present I am living with my mother at Rugeley. Before that I have been living among my friends. I know a man named Dutton. He is a cousin of mine in the Potteries. I left Dolly's of my own accord because I did not like the place. I can read, and I read the newspapers. I have heard of the case of a person named Dove, who was supposed to have murdered his wife at Leeds. I merely heard that it was another strychnine case, but the symptoms of strychnine were not mentioned. I will swear that I mentioned twitching to the coroner. If I did not use the exact word, I said something to the same effect. I will swear that I have used the word twitching before I came to London. The words twitching and jerking were not first suggested to me. I did not say anything about the broth having made me sick before the coroner, because it did not occur to me. I did tell the coroner that I tasted the broth, and that I did not observe anything particular about it. I was examined several times, and I was questioned particularly upon the subject of the broth, and I said on one occasion that I thought the broth was very good. I did not at the time think it was the broth that had caused the sickness. I was so ill that I was obliged to go to bed, but I could not at all account for it. I only took two tablespoonfuls, and the sickness came on in about half an hour. I never knew of Mr. Cook taking coffee in bed before those occasions. I have said that Mr. Palmer ordered coffee for Cook. I have no doubt that is correct. I cannot remember so well today as I did yesterday. 
I cannot remember whether I told the coroner that I had not seen Mr. Palmer when I gave the deceased the coffee. I don't remember whether I had said anything before the coroner about seeing a box of pills in the deceased's bedroom on the Monday night, and that Palmer was in the room at the time. Perhaps I was not asked the question. I did nothing but answer questions that were put to me. I am sure that Palmer was in the room on that night. I remember that he brought a jar of jelly, and I opened it. I swear that the deceased told me that the pills Palmer had given him had made him ill. I did not say this before the coroner. I was asked some questions by Dr. Collier with regard to what I had stated to the coroner, and I said that my evidence had been altered, as some things had occurred to me since, and I had made another statement to a gentleman. I gave this additional statement to a gentleman at Dolly's. I don't know who the gentleman was. I did not ask him, and he did not tell me. He did not ask me many questions. He put a few to me and wrote down my answers. He mentioned Mr. Stevens's name. Mr. Stevens was there. Sergeant Shee, why did you not tell me that? Because you did not ask me, a laugh. Cross-examination continued. I did not tell the coroner that Mr. Cook was beating the bedclothes on the Monday night. I did say that he sometimes threw his head back and then would raise himself up again, and I believe I also said that he could hardly speak for shortness of breath. I did not say that he called murder twice, and I do not remember saying that he twitched while I was rubbing his hands. I did not say anything about toast and water being given to Mr. Cook by order of Palmer in a spoon, or that he snapped at the spoon and bit it so hard that it was difficult to get it out of his mouth. The Lord Chief Justice here interposed and intimated his opinion that it would be a fairer course to read the witnesses' depositions. The other judges concurred. The Attorney General said he should have interposed, but it was his intention to adduce evidence to show the manner in which the case was conducted by the coroner, and that he was expostulated with upon omitting to put proper questions and also omitting to take down the answers that were given. Cross-examination continued. I should have answered all those questions if they had been put to me. I was not purposely recalled to state the symptoms of the deceased in the presence of Dr. Taylor. When the prisoner came to the Talbot on the Tuesday night, he had a plaid dressing gown on, but I cannot say whether he had a cap or not. I did not observe that the prisoner appeared at all confused at the time he was examining the clothes and the bed of the deceased. A model of the prisoner's house and of the hotel was here produced. The deposition of the witness was put in and read for the purpose of showing that the statements made by her in the examination on Wednesday were omitted when she was examined by the coroner. The witness was re-examined by Mr. E. James. I was examined on a great many different days by the coroner. I was not asked to describe all the symptoms I saw. The coroner himself put the questions to me, and his clerk took down the answers. I merely answered the questions, and I was not told to describe all I saw. The coroner asked me if the broth had any effect upon me, and I said, not that I was aware of. I don't know what brought the sickness to my mind afterwards, but I think that someone else in the house brought the fact to my memory. I certainly did vomit after I took the broth, and was obliged to go to bed. I am quite sure the deceased told me that it was the pills Palmer had given him, that had made him ill. When Mr. Collier came to see me, he said that he was for the Crown, and he then asked me questions about the inquest and the death of Mr. Cook. I answered all the questions he put to me, and he took them down in writing and carried the statement away with him. Two other persons waited outside the house. I am engaged to be married to one of the Duttons. Sergeant She. Did not Dr. Collier tell you that he was neither for the Crown nor for the defence, but for the truth? Witness. No, what he said was that he was for the Crown, but what he desired above all things was to know the truth, and that he asked me to tell him without fear, favour, or affection. Mr. Gardner. Examined by the Attorney General. I am a member of the firm of Gardner and Company of Rugeley. I acted in this matter for the firm of Cookson and Company, the solicitors of Mr. Stevens, the father-in-law of Cook. I attended the inquest on the body of Cook, and occasionally put questions to the witnesses. Mr. Ward, an attorney, was the coroner. 
he put questions to the witnesses and his clerk took down the answers the inquest lasted five days and several times upon each day i expostulated with the coroner on account of his omitting to put questions mr sergeant shee submitted that what was said by the coroner was no evidence against the prisoner the attorney general it is not intended as evidence against the prisoner but to rebut the effect of evidence that you have put in i will ask had you occasion to expostulate with the coroner as to the omission of his clerk to take down the answers of witnesses mr sergeant shee i object to the question being put in that form the attorney general did you observe that the clerk omitted to take down the answers of elizabeth mills not in reference to that particular case mr baron alderson her account of the matter is that the questions were not put the attorney general did dr taylor object that questions were not put which ought to have been put i do not recollect it lord campbell it is not suggested as i understand that the coroner refused to correct any mistakes that were made the attorney general i am prepared to show that there was such misconduct on the part of the coroner as led to expostulation mr sergeant she don't state that unless you are going to prove it the attorney general it is suggested that a witness has given evidence here which she did not give before the coroner my object is to show first that questions were not put to her which might and ought to have been put secondly that her answers to other questions were not taken down lord campbell held that the evidence was not admissible witness cross-examined by sergeant she the jury put a great many questions re-examined the jury made very strong observations as to the necessity of putting questions the attorney general did they assign any reason for interfering when they put questions mr sergeant she objected to this question on the ground that it did not arise out of his cross-examination lord campbell my learned brethren think that evidence upon this point is not admissible mr justice cresswell said the depositions which had been put in did not show that any questions had been put by the jurymen if they had contained such questions they would have shown the motive of the jury in putting them but the court was left totally in the dark as to whether questions had been put by the coroner or any other person for anything that appeared to the contrary the witnesses might have made a voluntary statement without any questions at all being put to them no foundation was laid therefore for the attorney-general's question mr baron alderson concurred mrs anne brooks examined by the attorney-general i live at manchester i am in the habit of attending races i was at shrewsbury races in november eighteen fifty five i saw palmer there on the fourteenth wednesday about eight o'clock in the evening i met him in the street and asked him whether he thought his horse chicken would win he desired me if i heard anything further about a horse belonging to lord darby which was also to run to call and tell him on the following day i went to the raven to see him at half-past ten o'clock on the thursday evening some friends waited for me in the road i went upstairs and asked a servant to tell palmer that i wished to speak to him the servant said he was there at the top of the stairs there are two passages one facing the other to the left i saw palmer standing by a small table in the passage he had a tumbler glass in his hand in which there appeared to be a small quantity of water i did not see him put anything into it there was a light between him and me and he held it up to the light he said to me i will be with you presently he saw me the moment i got to the top of the stairs he stood at the table a minute or two longer with the glass in his hand holding it up to the light once or twice and now and then shaking it i made an observation about the fineness of the weather the door of the sitting-room which i supposed was unoccupied was partially open and he went into it taking the glass with him in two or three minutes he came out again with the glass what was in the glass was still the colour of water he then carried it into his own sitting-room the door of which was shut he afterwards came out and brought me a glass with brandy and water in it it might have been the same glass i had some of the brandy and water it produced no unpleasant consequences 
we had some conversation about the races. In the course of it, he said he should go back to his own horse, Chicken. I was present at the race when Chicken ran and lost. Cross-examined by Mr. Sergeant Shee. I am married. Brooks is the name of my husband. He never goes with me to races. I live with him. I don't attend many races in the course of a year. My husband has a high appointment and does not sanction my going to races. A great number of racing men were ill at Shrewsbury on the Wednesday. There was a wonder as to what had caused their illness, and something was said about the water being poisoned. People were affected by sickness and purging. I knew some persons who were so affected. The passage in which I saw Palmer holding the glass led to a good many rooms. I think it was lighted by gas. I supposed that he was mixing some cooling drink. Re-examined. I was not examined before the coroner. The brandy and water which Palmer gave me was cold. I had been on friendly terms with him. I had known him a number of years as a racing man. Lavinia Barnes, examined by Mr. E. James. In November 1855, I was a waitress at the Talbot Arms. I knew Palmer and Cook. Cook called there on the 12th, Monday, as he was going to the races. He did not complain of illness. I saw him when he returned on the 15th. On the Friday, he came between 9 and 10 o'clock in the evening after dining with Palmer. He spoke to me. He was sober. On the Saturday, I saw him twice. Some broth was sent over and taken up to him by me. He could not take it. He was too sick. I carried it down and put it in the kitchen. I afterwards saw Palmer and told him Cook was too sick to take it. Palmer said he must have it. Elizabeth Mills afterwards took it up again. She was taken ill with violent vomiting on the Sunday between twelve and one o'clock. She went to bed and did not come downstairs till four or five o'clock. I saw some broth on that day in the kitchen. It was in a sick cup with two handles not belonging to the house. I did not see it brought. The cup went back to Palmer's. On the Monday morning between seven and eight o'clock, I saw Palmer and he told Mills he was going to London. I also saw Cook during the day. Sanders came to see him, and I took him up some brandy and water. I slept that night in the next room to Cook's. Palmer came between eight and nine o'clock in the evening and went upstairs, but I did not see whether he went into Cook's room. About twelve o'clock I was in the kitchen, when Cook's bell rang violently. I went upstairs. Cook was very ill, and asked me to send for Palmer. He screamed out, Murder! he exclaimed that he was in violent pain that he was suffocating his eyes were wild looking standing a great way out of his head he was beating the bed with his arms he cried out christ have mercy on my soul i never saw a person in such a state having called up mills i left to send boots for palmer palmer came and i again went into the room cook was then more composed he said oh doctor i shall die palmer replied don't be alarmed my lad i saw cook drink a darkish mixture out of a glass i don't know who gave it to him i both saw and heard him snap at the glass he brought up the draught i left him between twelve and one o'clock when he was much more composed on the tuesday he seemed a little better at night a little before twelve o'clock the bell rang again i was in the kitchen mills went upstairs i followed her and heard cook screaming but did not go into the room. I stood outside the door and saw Palmer come. He had been fetched. I said as he passed me, Mr. Cook is ill again. He said, Oh, is he? and went into the room. He was dressed in his usual manner and wore a black coat and a cap. I remained on the landing when Palmer came out. As he went downstairs, Mills asked him how Cook was. He said to her and to me, he is not so bad by fifty parts as he was last night. I heard Cook ask to be turned over before I went in, while Palmer was there. I went in after Palmer had left, but I came out before Cook died. After he died on the Tuesday, I went into the room and found Palmer with a coat in his hand. He was clearing out the pockets of the coat and looking under the bolster. I said, Oh, Mr. Cook can't be dead. Palmer said, He is. I knew he would be and then left the room. I saw him on the Thursday morning. He came into the body of the hall and asked for the key of Mr. Cook's bedroom, in which the body was lying. The key was in the bar. 
he said he wanted some books and papers and a paper knife for they were to go back to the stationers or else he would have to pay for them i went with him into the room he then requested me to go to miss bond for some books i went downstairs and fetched the books when i returned he was still in the room looking for the paper knife on the top of the chest of drawers among books papers and clothes he said i can't find the knife anywhere miss bond the housekeeper afterwards came up and i left on the friday between three and four o'clock i saw mr jones with palmer jones said he thought palmer knew where the betting book was palmer asked me to go and look for it and said it was sure to be found but it was not worth anything to any one but cook mills and i went up to look for it but we could not find it we searched everywhere in the bed and all round the room but not in the drawers we went down and told palmer and jones that we could not find it palmer said oh it will be found somewhere i'll go with you and look myself he did not go with us but left the house i did not see him come out of the room on the thursday there was no reason for our not looking in the drawers some people were in the room at the time nailing the coffin cross-examined by mr sergeant she cook had some coffee on the saturday between twelve and one i did not pay any particular attention to the time when palmer went up on the monday i am not sure it was before half-past nine but i am sure it was before ten i don't remember whether cook touched the glass from which he drank the mixture i think some one else was holding it there was some of cook's linen in several of the drawers there was a portmanteau containing other things besides those in the drawers there were dress clothes an overcoat and morning clothes the door was locked on the night of the death the women were sent for to lay out the corpse before it was light the undertaker went on the following morning and the door was locked after they left they came again on the thursday night had the key and went up by themselves the body was put into the coffin the day stevens was there the women were in the room with the undertakers when i looked for the book re-examined by the attorney-general the chambermaid and i were in and out of the room while the women were laying out the body but they were sometimes left alone i saw nothing of the book at that time i had seen it before in cook's hand but i don't remember seeing it in the room anne rowley examined by mr wellsby i live at rugeley and have frequently been employed as charwoman by palmer on the saturday before cook died palmer sent me to mr robinson's at the albion inn for a little broth for cook i fetched the broth took it to palmer's house and put it to the fire in the back kitchen to warm after doing so i went about my work in other parts of the house when the broth was hot palmer brought it to me in the kitchen and poured it into a cup he told me to take it to the talbot arms for cook to ask if he would take a little bread or toast with it and to say that smith had sent it by lord campbell he did not say why i was to say that examination resumed there is a mr jeremiah smith at rugeley he is called jerry smith he is a friend of palmer's i took the broth to the talbot arms and gave it to lavinia barnes cross-examined by sergeant she mr smith was in the habit of putting up at the albion he was friendly with cook cook was to have dined with smith that day but was not able to go mrs robinson the landlady of the albion made the broth but i don't know by whose orders by lord campbell the broth was at the fire in palmer's kitchen about five minutes charles hawley examined by mr bodkin i am a gardener living at rugeley and was occasionally employed by the prisoner in his garden on the sunday before cook died palmer asked me to take some broth to cook that was at palmer's house where i was in the habit of going it was between twelve and one o'clock he gave me the broth in a small cup with a cover over it and told me to take it to the talbot arms for cook i did so i cannot say whether or not the broth was hot i gave it to one of the servant girls at the talbot arms but which i cannot say the witness was not cross-examined sarah bond examined by mr huddleston in november last i was housekeeper at the talbot arms i knew cook he stayed at the talbot arms 
I remember his going to Shrewsbury Races on the 12th of November. He returned on the Thursday. I heard him say that he was very poorly. I did not see him on the Friday or Saturday. On Sunday I saw him about eight o'clock in the evening. He was in bed. He said that he had been very poorly, but was better. Very soon afterwards I saw Palmer. I asked him what he thought of Cook, and he replied that he was better. On Saturday night Smith had slept in the room with Cook. On the Sunday evening I asked Palmer if Cook would not want somebody with him that night, and Palmer replied that he was so much better that it would not be necessary that any one should be with him. I asked if Daniel Jenkins, the boots, should sleep in the room. Palmer said that Cook was so much better he had much rather he did not. On the Monday morning, a little before seven o'clock, I saw Palmer again. He came into the kitchen to me. I asked him how Cook was. He said he was better, and requested me to make him a cup of coffee. He did not say anything about its strength. He remained in the kitchen, and I made the coffee and gave it to him. He told me that he was going to London, and that he had written for Mr. Jones to come to see Cook. On the Monday night, hearing from the waitress that Cook was ill, I went up to his room between eleven and twelve o'clock. When I went into the room, Cook was alone. He was sitting up in bed, resting on his elbow. He seemed disappointed, and said he did not want to see me, but Palmer. I went out on to the landing, and soon afterwards Palmer came. Palmer went into the room. I could not see what was done in the room. Palmer came out, went away for a few minutes, and then returned. After he came back, I heard that Cook had vomited. Cook said he thought he should die. Palmer cheered him up and said that he would do all he could to prevent it. When Palmer came out of the room again, I asked him if Cook had any relatives, and he said that he only had a stepfather. I saw Cook again between three and four o'clock on Tuesday. That was when Mr. Jones came. A little after six o'clock, I took some jelly up to Cook. He seemed very anxious for it, and said that he thought he should die. I thought he seemed better. I did not see him again alive. Between eight and nine o'clock on Wednesday morning, I locked the door of the room in which Cook's body lay. About nine o'clock I gave the key to Mr. Tolly, the barber, when he came to shave the corpse. On Thursday I gave it to Lavinia Barnes. After that I went up to the room and met Palmer coming out of it. After I came out, the door was locked, and I had the key. On Friday, when Mr. Stevens came, I gave the key to the undertaker. Cross-examined by Mr. Grove. The passengers by the express train from London arrived at Rugeley about ten o'clock in the evening. They come by fly from Stafford. William Henry Jones, examined by the Attorney General. I am a surgeon living at Lutterworth. I have been in practice fifteen years. I was acquainted with Cook, who from time to time resided at my house. I had been on terms of intimacy with him nearly five years. He was twenty-eight years of age when he died, and unmarried. He was originally educated for the law, but of late years had devoted himself to agriculture and the turf. The last year or two he had no farm. He kept racehorses and betted. I had known Palmer about twelve months. Lately, Cook considered my house at Lutterworth as his home. I have attended him professionally. His health was generally good, but he was not very robust. He was a man of active habits. He both hunted and played cricket. In November last, he invited me to go to Shrewsbury to see his horse run, and I went. I spent Tuesday the 13th with him there. That was the day on which Polestar ran and won. I dined with Cook and other friends at the Raven Hotel, where he was staying. The horse having won, there was a little extra champagne drunk. We dined between six and seven o'clock, and the party broke up between eight and nine. Cook afterwards accompanied me round the town. We went to Mr. Frail's, who is clerk of the course. I saw Cook produce his betting book to White House, the jockey. He calculated his winnings on Polestar. There were figures in the book. Cook made a statement as to his winnings. Mr. Sergeant Shee objected to this statement being given in evidence, and the Attorney General, therefore, did not ask any questions as to its purport. Examination resumed. 
I left the Raven Hotel at ten o'clock. Cook was then at the door. He was not at all the worse for liquor. He was in his usual health. On the following Monday I received a letter from Palmer. This letter, which was put in and read, was as follows. Quote, My dear sir, Mr. Cook was taken ill at Shrewsbury and obliged to call in a medical man. Since then he has been confined to his bed here with a very severe bilious attack, combined with diarrhoea. I think it desirable for you to come and see him as soon as possible. November 18th, 1855. William Palmer. End quote. Examination resumed. On that day, Monday, I was very unwell. On the next day I went to Rugeley. I arrived at the Talbot Arms about half-past three o'clock in the afternoon, and immediately went up to Cook's room. He said that he was very comfortable, but he had been very ill at Shrewsbury. He did not detail the symptoms, but said that he was obliged to call in a medical man. Palmer came in. I examined Cook in Palmer's presence. He had a natural pulse. I looked at his tongue, which was clean. I said it was hardly the tongue of a bilious diarrhoea attack. Palmer replied, you should have seen it before. I did not then prescribe for Cook. In the course of the afternoon I visited him several times. He changed for the better. His spirits and pulse both improved. I gave him, at his request, some toast and water, and he vomited. There was no diarrhoea. The toast and water was in the room. Mr. Bamford came in the evening about seven o'clock. Palmer had told me that Mr. Bamford had been called in. Mr. Bamford expressed his opinion that Cook was going on very satisfactorily. We were talking about what he was to have, and Cook objected to the pills of the previous night. Palmer was there all the time. Cook said the pills made him ill. I do not remember to whom he addressed this observation. We three, Palmer, Bamford, and myself, went out upon the landing. Palmer proposed that Mr. Bamford should make up some morphine pills as before, at the same time requesting me not to mention to Cook what they contained, as he objected to the morphine so much. Mr. Bamford agreed to this, and he went away. I went back to Cook's room, and Palmer went with me. During the evening I was several times in Cook's room. He seemed very comfortable all the evening. There was no more vomiting, nor any diarrhoea, but there was a natural motion of the bowels. I observed no bilious symptoms about Cook. By Lord Campbell. Did he appear to have recently suffered from a bilious attack? No. Examination resumed. Palmer and I went to his house about eight o'clock. I remained there about half an hour and then returned to Cook. I next saw Palmer in Cook's room at nearly eleven o'clock. He had brought with him a box of pills. He opened the paper on which the direction was written in my presence. That paper was round the box. He called my attention to the paper, saying, What an excellent handwriting for an old man! I did not read the direction, but looked at the writing, which was very good. Palmer proposed to Cook that he should take the pills. Cook protested very much against it, because they had made him so ill the previous night. Palmer repeated the request several times, and at last Cook complied with it and took the pills. The moment he took them, he vomited into the utensil. Palmer and myself, at Palmer's request, searched in it for the pills, to see whether they were returned. We found nothing but toast and water. I do not know when Cook had drunk the toast and water, but it was standing by the bedside all the evening. The vomiting could not have been caused by the contents of the pills, nor by the act of swallowing. After vomiting, Cook laid down and appeared quiet. Before Palmer came, Cook had got up and sat in a chair. His spirits were very good. He was laughing and joking, talking of what he should do with himself during the winter. After he had taken the pills, I went downstairs to my supper, and returned to his room at nearly twelve o'clock. His room was double-bedded, and it had been arranged that I should sleep in it that night. I talked to Cook for a few minutes, and then went to bed. When I last talked to him, he was rather sleepy, but quite as well as he had been during the evening. There was nothing about him to excite any apprehensions. I had been in bed about ten minutes, and had not gone to sleep, when he suddenly started up in bed and called out, 
doctor get up i am going to be ill ring the bell and send for palmer i rang the bell the chambermaid came and cook called out to her fetch mr palmer he asked me to give him something i declined and said palmer will be here directly cook was then sitting up in bed the room was rather dark and i did not observe anything particular in his countenance he asked me to rub the back of his neck i did so i supported him with my arm there was a stiffness about the muscles of his neck palmer came very soon two or three minutes at the utmost after the chambermaid went for him he said i never dressed so quickly in my life i did not observe how he was dressed he gave cook two pills which he told me were ammonia pills cook swallowed them directly he did so he uttered loud screams threw himself back in the bed and was dreadfully convulsed that could not have been the result of the action of the pills last taken cook said raise me up i shall be suffocated that was at the commencement of the convulsions which lasted five or ten minutes the convulsions affected every muscle of the body and were accompanied by stiffening of the limbs i endeavoured to raise cook with the assistance of palmer but found it quite impossible owing to the rigidity of the limbs when cook found we could not raise him up he asked me to turn him over he was then quite sensible i turned him on to his side i listened to the action of his heart i found that it gradually weakened and asked palmer to fetch some spirits of ammonia to be used as a stimulant palmer went to his house and fetched the bottle he was away a very short time when he returned the pulsations of the heart were gradually ceasing and life was almost extinct cook died very quietly a short time afterwards from the time he called to me to that of his death there elapsed about ten minutes or a quarter of an hour he died of tetanus which is a spasmodic affection of the muscles of the whole body it causes death by stopping the action of the heart the sense of suffocation is caused by the contraction of the respiratory muscles the room was so dark that i could not observe what was the outward appearance of cook's body after death when he threw himself back in the bed he clinched his hands and they remained clinched after death when i was rubbing his neck his head and neck were unnaturally bent back by the spasmodic action of the muscles after death his body was so twisted or bowed that if i had placed it upon the back it would have rested upon the head and the feet by lord campbell when did you first observe that twisting or bowing when cook threw himself back in bed examination resumed the jaw was affected by the spasmodic action palmer remained half an hour or an hour after cook's death i suggested that we should have some women to lay cook out i left the room to speak to the housekeeper about this seeing two maids on the landing i sent them into the room where palmer was with cook's body i went downstairs and spoke to the housekeeper and then returned to the bedroom when i went back palmer had cook's coat in his hand he said to me you as his nearest friend had better take possession of his effects i took cook's watch and his purse containing five sovereigns and five shillings which was all i could find i saw no betting book nor any papers or letters belonging to cook i found no banknotes before palmer left did he say anything to you on the subject of affairs between himself and cook he did soon after cook's death he said it is a bad thing for me that mr cook is dead as i am responsible for three thousand pounds or four thousand pounds and i hope mr cook's friends will not let me lose it if they do not assist me all my horses will be seized he said nothing about securities or papers i was present when mr stevens cook's stepfather came palmer said that if mr stevens did not bury cook he should i did not recollect that there was any question about burying him mr stevens palmer mr bamford and myself dined together after dinner mr stevens in palmer's presence asked me to go and look for cook's betting book i went to look for it and palmer followed me the night that cook died the betting book was mentioned what was said about it palmer said that it would be of use to no one what led to this my taking possession of the effects did you make any observation about the book i cannot recollect did you find it no did you make any remark no particular remark did palmer know what you were looking for yes how 
I said, where is the betting book? Upon that, he said, it is of no use to any one. You are sure he said that? Yes. When I went to look for the book, at Mr. Stevens's request, Palmer followed me. I looked for the book for two or three minutes, but did not find it. I told the maid-servants that I could not find it. Palmer returned with me to the dining-room, and I told Mr. Stevens that I could not find the book. By Lord Campbell. When Palmer, Mr. Bamford, and myself held the consultation on the landing on the Tuesday night, nothing was said about the spasms of the night before. Cross-examined by Mr. Sergeant Shee. I am a regular medical practitioner, and I have for fifteen years practised medicine as a means of gaining a living. I am a licentiate of the Apothecaries Company, and have endeavoured, both as a young man and since, to qualify myself for my profession. When I saw Cook, his throat was slightly ulcerated, but he could swallow very well, although with a little pain. I know that he had applied caustic to his tongue, but he had ceased to do so for two months. He did not, after that, continue to complain of pain in his throat or tongue. I saw him frequently during the races, and never heard him express any apprehension about spots which appeared upon his body, although he did express apprehensions of secondary symptoms resulting from syphilis. I am not aware that at the time he died he was suffering from the venereal disease, but I know that he had it about a twelve month ago. He had been reduced in circumstances some time before he died, but he was redeeming them. I do not know that he was frequently in want of small sums of money. I believe that he owned a mare, in conjunction with Palmer, named Pyrene, which was under the care of Sanders, the trainer. The race which Polestar won was a matter of great importance to the deceased. He was much excited at the race, and more particularly so after it. Deceased was a very temperate man, and did not exceed in wine on the evening of the race. The next I heard of him was through the letter from Palmer. Palmer knew perfectly well who I was, and that I was in practice as a surgeon at Lutterworth. When I saw deceased, he objected to take morphia pills because they had made him ill the night before. He did not say that Dr. Savage had forbidden him to take the morphia, but he said that he had been directed not to take mercury or opium. The effect of morphia would be to soothe and to cause slight constipation. When I saw him, and he roused up a little, he said, Palmer, give me the remedy you gave me last night. I rubbed the deceased's neck for about five minutes. He died very quietly. I had seen cases of tetanus before. I think I mentioned tetanus at the inquest. I am sure if you refer to my depositions, you will find that I mentioned tetanus and convulsions both. The depositions were referred to, and there was no mention of tetanus in them. Witness continued, however. I am sure that I mentioned tetanus. The Attorney General. I must set this right. I have here the original deposition, and I find the matter stands thus. There were strong symptoms of... Then there is a word, compression, struck out. And then there is the word, tetanus, also struck out. It is evident that the clerk did not know the meaning of what he was writing. And then the words violent convulsions are added so that the sentence stands there were strong symptoms of violent convulsions by mr sergeant she i also said before the coroner that i could not tell the cause of death and that i imagined at the time that it was from over excitement the lord chief justice said that the learned counsel must not read detached portions of the depositions the whole must be read the depositions were accordingly read by the clerk of the arraigns. Cross-examination continued. I do not recollect that I ever said that deceased died of epilepsy. Dr. Bamford said that he died in an apoplectic fit, and I said that I thought he did not. I said that I thought it was more like an epileptic fit than an apoplectic fit. I do not know Mr. Pratt, but I took a letter from him to Cook. Cook did not open it, but said, I know the contents of it. Let it be till to-morrow morning. I have seen Palmer's racing establishment at Rugeley. I saw a number of mares in foal, and others in the paddock, and some very valuable horses. The stables were good, and the establishment appeared to be a large and expensive one. Re-examined by the Attorney-General. 
I am not a good judge of the value of racing horses, but I understand other horses very well. I have only seen one case of tetanus, and that case resulted from a wound. The patient in that case lasted three days before death ensued. I am satisfied that the death of Mr. Cook did not arise from epilepsy. In epilepsy, consciousness is lost, but there is no rigidity or convulsive spasm of the muscles. The symptoms are quite different. I am equally certain that death was not the result of apoplexy. Lavinia Barnes was recalled at the instance of Mr. Sergeant Shee, and in answer to the learned sergeant, she said, On Monday morning, Mr. Cook said to me that he had been very ill on Sunday night, just before twelve o'clock, and that he had rung the bell for someone to come to him, but he thought that they had all gone to bed. Elizabeth Mills, recalled by the Attorney General, and examined on the same point. I remember on Monday morning asking Mr. Cook how he was, and he said that he had been disturbed in the night, adding, I was just mad for two minutes. I said, Why did you not ring the bell? And he replied, I thought you would all be fast asleep and would not hear me. The illness passed away, and I managed to get over it without. He also said he thought he had been disturbed by the noise of a quarrel in the street. Dr. Henry Savage, physician, of seven Gloucester Place, examined by the Attorney General. I knew John Parsons Cook. He had been in the habit of consulting me professionally during the last four years. He was a man not of robust constitution, but his general health was good. He came to me in May 1855, but I saw him about November of the year before, and early in the spring of 1855. In the spring of 1855, the old affair, indigestion, was one cause of his visiting me, and he had some spots upon his body, about which he was uneasy. He had also two shallow ulcers on his tongue, which corresponded with two bad teeth. He said that he had been under a mild mercurial course, and he imagined that those spots were syphilitic. I thought they were not, and I recommended the discontinuance of mercury. I gave him quinine as a tonic and an aperient composed of cream of tartar, magnesia and sulphur. I never at any time gave him antimony. Under the treatment which I prescribed the sores gradually disappeared and they were quite well by the end of May. I saw him, however, frequently in June and he still felt some little anxiety about the accuracy of my opinion. If any little spot made its appearance, he came to me and I also was anxious on the subject, as my opinion differed from that of another medical man in London. Every time he came to me I examined him carefully. There were no indications of a syphilitic character about the sores, and there was no ulceration of the throat, but one of the tonsils was slightly enlarged and tender. I saw him last alive, and carefully examined him, either on the 3rd or 5th of November. There was, in my judgment, no venereal taint about him at the time. Cross-examined by Mr. Sergeant Shee. I do not think that the deceased was fond of taking mercury before I advised him against it, but he was timid on the subject of his throat, and was apt to take the advice of any one. No, I don't think that he would take quack medicines. I don't think he was so foolish as that. Charles Newton, called and examined by Mr. James Q.C. I am assistant to Mr. Salt, a surgeon at Rugeley. I know the prisoner, William Palmer. I remember Monday the 19th of November. I saw Palmer that evening at Mr. Salt's surgery about nine o'clock. I was alone when he came there. He asked me for three grains of strychnine, and I weighed it accurately and gave it to him, enclosed in a piece of paper. He said nothing further but good night, and took it away with him. I knew him to be a medical man, and gave it him, made no charge for it. The whole transaction did not occupy more than two or three minutes. I again saw Palmer on the following day between eleven and twelve o'clock. He was then at the shop of Mr. Hawkins, a druggist. He asked me how I was, and put his hand upon my shoulder, and said he wished to speak with me. Accordingly, I went out into the street with him and he then asked me when Mr. Edwin Salt was going to his farm. The farm in question was at a place about fourteen miles distant from Rugeley. Palmer had nothing whatever to do with that farm, but Mr. Salt's going there was a rumour of the town. 
while we were talking a mr brassington came up and spoke to me and during our conversation palmer went into hawkins's shop again palmer came out of the shop a second time while i was still talking to brassington i am not sure whether palmer spoke to me at that time but he went past me in the direction of his own house which is about two hundred yards from hawkins i then went into hawkins shop where i saw roberts mr hawkins apprentice and i had some conversation with him about palmer i knew a man named thirlby who had been an assistant and a partner of palmer palmer usually dealt with thirlby for his drugs in fact thirlby dispensed palmer's medicine on sunday the twenty fifth of november about seven o'clock in the evening i was sent for and went to palmer's house i found palmer when i got there in his kitchen he was sitting by the fire reading he asked me how i was and to have some brandy and water no one else was present he asked me what was the dose of strychnine to give to kill a dog i told him a grain he asked me what would be the appearance of the stomach after death i told him that there would be no inflammation and that i did not think it would be found upon that he snapped his finger and thumb in a quiet way and exclaimed as if communing with himself that's all right sensation he made some other remarks of a commonplace character which i do not recollect i was with him altogether about five minutes on the following day monday the twenty sixth of november i heard that a post-mortem examination was to take place i went to dr bamford's house intending to accompany him to the post-mortem and i found palmer there in the study that was about ten o'clock in the day palmer asked me what i wanted i told him that i had come to attend the post-mortem he asked whether i thought mr salt was going and i replied that he was engaged and could not go i took the necessary instruments with me and went down to the talbot arms dr harland and mr freer a surgeon practising at rugeley were both there they went away however for a short time and left palmer and me together in the entrance of the hall at the talbot arms he spoke to me he said it will be a dirty job i will go and have some brandy i went with him to his house which was just opposite he gave me two wine glasses of neat brandy and he took the same quantity himself he said you'll find this fellow suffering from a diseased throat he has had syphilis and has taken a great deal of mercury i afterwards went over with palmer to the post-mortem and found the other doctors there during the post-mortem palmer stood near to dr bamford against the fire i was examined before the coroner and did not state before that functionary that i had given palmer three grains of strychnine on the night of the nineteenth of november the first person that i told of it was cheshire the postmaster mr sergeant she objected to anything that this witness had said to cheshire being admitted as evidence against the prisoner the court ruled in favour of the objection cross-examined by mr grove q c it might have been a week or two or three days after i gave palmer the strychnine that i first mentioned the occurrence to any one i think i may undertake to say that it was not a fortnight afterwards subsequently to the inquest i was examined for the purpose of giving evidence on the part of the crown i cannot say how long after the inquest that was when i was first examined on behalf of the crown i did not mention the three grains of strychnine but i did mention the conversation about the poisoning of the dog that was not the first time that i had mentioned that conversation for i had mentioned it before to mr salt but i cannot tell how long before I was examined twice for the purpose of the prosecution by the crown i did not mention cook suffering from sore throat at the inquest but i did mention the conversation which took place at hawkins shop at that time i knew it had been alleged that palmer had purchased strychnine at hawkins's and i presumed that my evidence was required with reference to that point i first stated on tuesday last for the purpose of this prosecution the fact of my having given palmer three grains of strychnine i cannot say whether in that examination i said that palmer said you will find this poor fellow suffering from a diseased throat i don't know whether i said poor fellow or rich fellow do you not know that there is a difference in the expression fellow and poor fellow i know that there is a difference between poor and rich 
it is impossible to recollect all that i said upon every occasion re-examined by the attorney-general i did not mention the circumstances of my having given the strychnine to palmer because mr salt my employer and palmer were not friends and i thought it would displease mr salt if he knew that i had let palmer have anything i first mentioned it to boycott the clerk of mr gardiner the solicitor at the rugeley station where i and a number of other witnesses were assembled for the purpose of coming to london as soon as i arrived in london boycott took me to mr gardiner's i communicated to him what i had to say and i was then taken to the solicitor of the treasury and i made the same statement to him mr sergeant she have you not given another reason for not mentioning the occurrence about the three grains of strychnine before the reason being that you were afraid that you could be indicted for perjury no i did not give that as a reason but i stated to a gentleman that a young man of wolverhampton had been threatened to be indicted for perjury by george palmer because he had said at the inquest upon walter palmer that he had sold the prisoner prussic acid and he had not entered it in the book and could not prove it i stated at the time that george palmer said he could be transported for it i did not enter the gift of the three grains of strychnine for mr salt's surgery in a book the inquest upon walter palmer did not take place till five or six weeks after the inquest upon cook the court then adjourned at twenty-five minutes past six o'clock until the next day the jury being conducted as on the previous evening to the london coffee-house in charge of the officers of the court End of section four.